I want to invite you tonight to the book of 2 Samuel in the 23rd chapter. I think I feel what every guest speaker here feels and probably every guest musician feels. Anytime you come to First Baptist Indian Trail, you know you're in a place where things are great all the time. And it's a little bit intimidating for all of us who visit your great church. And this is, I believe, the fourth or fifth time I've had the privilege of being here. And every time I get ready to come to this church, I want to make sure that I bring you a word from God. I was talking to Mary Alice in the hotel room today, and I said, the verse that's on my heart is Romans chapter 1 in the 11th verse. Paul said, I long to visit you so that I may impart to you some gift to help you grow stronger in the Lord. I know you're already strong in the Lord, and I want to help you grow stronger with the word that God has given me tonight. And the verse right after that says that we mutually benefit from each other's faith. And I can tell you that this church has benefited my life, and your pastor and wife, Mike and Kathy, are two of the dearest friends that Mary Alice and I have. And as I've said before in this spot, what I love so much about Pastor Mike is he is real. And when he preaches the Word of God, you know that he has the power of God on his life. So tonight, I want to bring you the word that I believe that God has put upon my heart to give you. One of the greatest heroes in the Bible is a man named David. And you know him, you know his story. It is a God story. David starts out as a shepherd boy and he winds up as a king. That within itself is unusual because normally you have to start out a prince to be a king. But David starts out a shepherd boy because God was with him. And his life had an echo effect and still does to this day. When Jesus came to our world, he identified with David. He called himself the son of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, the chapter you have before you, David is coming to the end of his mostly successful life. And if some of you have a study Bible, you may have these words at the beginning of chapter 23, the last words of David. In this chapter, as great as David was and as spectacular as his victories were, it is not the celebration of David as the hero, especially in the latter part of this chapter. Rather, it is the celebration of the heroes who served David. David was king. There was only one David. Nobody could take his place. But I find it interesting that Scripture has made room for heroes who served David. Tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ is our king, and no one can take his place, and no one's glory gets close to his. However, as we look in the Word of God, especially in chapters like Hebrews chapter 11, we see that God has made room for others who are heroes who serve the King. Tonight, I felt led to bring to you a message that would challenge us to be heroes in the service of the King, and I started to preach a message called Heroes. But after I read and reread this chapter, I realized that even though I had the right chapter, I had the wrong name. Indeed, these are heroes. 2 Samuel 23, 8 says, these are the names of David's mightiest warriors. But I realized as I read through this chapter that these were not heroes who won battles. These were battles that made heroes. And so I changed the title of my message from heroes to the one word title, Battles. It's strange, isn't it? We want to be heroes because of what we accomplish. And yet, when we get to the last chapter of our life, it's more likely that our lives are going to be characterized not by what we've achieved, but rather by the battles that we have fought and by the grace of God we have won. Battles the stuff that you would have never chosen, the things that if the truth were told, you would have given anything in your life to have avoided. Battles by the very title, the very word itself, the concept is unpleasant. I'm sure that in David's reign of 40 years, there were many celebrations. We like celebrations. I'm sure there were picnics, there were county fairs, there were block parties. 
But I find it interesting that the Bible doesn't spend much time as it gives ink to David's 40-year reign talking about the celebrations. Instead, the Bible talks about battles because battles have a way of defining who we are. We grew up and we went to school and we learned history. Some of you learned it in college. And the way the history books are written, it is as if there are heroes and these heroes make battles. I do think that many times it's that misconception that causes many of us to question whether or not we can be heroes in the service of God. Because we look at ourselves, we look at our resources, we look at our frailties and we say, how can I be a hero? And because of that, some of us shy away from the battle. But when you study history, you'll find that it's just the opposite. It is not that heroes make battles, it is that battles have a way of making heroes. When presidential history of the United States is written about, usually Abraham Lincoln is considered the greatest American president. And yet you wonder if it had not been for the Civil War, which he would never have wanted and never have chosen, but if it had not been for the Civil War, he probably would have been just one of the other nondescript 19th century presidents whose names we can't remember. It is said that Winston Churchill was the greatest person in the 20th century, but without World War II, I don't even think he'd become prime minister. Neither man, neither Lincoln nor Churchill would have chosen the battles that defined their lives. Now, as I get into this this evening, I want this to be real for us because I know sometimes in church when preachers preach about such topics and because they are metaphorical in nature, sometimes we get lost in metaphorical terms. So I want to be sure that when we walk out of this building tonight, when we talk about battles and spiritual battles and warfare, I want you to be sure it's something you can take with you tomorrow morning and that it's real and not just, not just language. When you think about a battle, it's simply this. You feel opposition. And especially for those who know, who know spiritual warfare, you will know that it, it's not normal. It, it's not the normal run-of-the-mill everyday stuff that we're up against. It's just opposition in your life. It's the thing where you can see the goal, but something big is standing in your way of achieving the goal. You want to raise godly kids, but something is in the way. You want to have a godly marriage, but something is in the way. You want to have a healthy mind and healthy emotions, but something is in the way. It is opposition. Between you and where you need to be, there is a fight. It is a problem. It is something that's working against you. And tonight in the message, even though I may make some references, I'm not going to try to apply this in your life because the battles I face are not the battles you face. And the battles that you face are not the battles necessarily the person sitting next to you is facing. And they're likely are are battles that some of you are facing right now that you can't even tell anybody about. So I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to help you, and you're going to have to apply this message in the sense of understanding the battles that you face and how spiritual warfare works against those battles. But I do know this. If you look at the man in the Bible who had perhaps the greatest warfare in his life other than Jesus Christ, it would probably be Job. And when I look at the book of Job, I find that the warfare that Job had to deal with was in three categories. It was in circumstances, it was in relationships, and it was on the inside. Job had to fight some battles for what was going on on the inside. I don't want to preach on this tonight, but I think Job dealt with a lot of anxiety. I think anxiety was a big issue for him. It is for some of us. It is for me. Remember when Job's kids were killed and all of his fortunes were lost, he said, the thing that I feared has come to pass. So evidently he dealt with anxieties all the time, like some of us do. He had battles within. He had battles with relationships because his wife didn't understand what was going on and his friends came and took him down and of course obviously circumstances. So tonight I would offer for your consideration those three categories as we look at the battles that we fight. Now in our chapter which lists for us the heroes of King David's reign and the battles they fought, there are three stories, and from those three stories, I want to extract from us, for us tonight some scriptural truth that I believe will help us. Some of us are in this first battle tonight, and that's in verse 10 of chapter 23 about the battle fought by a man named Eleazar. Read with me, please. Eleazar stood his ground. 
Now we'll see that again. Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. There is an expression in this story that I love so much. When we read that verse, it tells us two things about Eleazar's hand. Number one, his hand grew tired, as all of us will grow weary in the battles that we must face. His hand grew tired, and eventually, and this is interesting to me, his hand froze to the sword. I grew up with the King James Version of the Bible, and there's a word that we don't use every day. It said his hand clave to the sword. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it just kind of says it, does it, doesn't it? What happened is Eleazar picked up the sword to do battle, and he just kept on fighting. And when he was tempted to quit, he thought, I'm just going to fight a little bit longer. And after a while, he noticed something. He noticed that his hand would not let go of the sword. There was a moment when Eleazar picked up the sword. He took hold of the sword, and there was also a moment when the sword took hold of Eleazar. There's, there are battles in life. And some of you are fighting them. Maybe you fought them for many years. There are battles in life that after a while, it's hard to know where the fabric of the challenge stops and your personal fabric starts. How many of you have fought battles for so long? Your personality is tied up in the warfare that you have fought in the course of serving the king. And, and you know, there was a point where you picked up the sword and you begin to do battle, but now that battle begins to define part of who you are. I turned 63 yesterday. I can't believe it. I have no idea how I got here. When I went to my church, it was so interesting. I think I've told you this before. When I was in college, Mary Allison and I, this was before we were married, I told her, I'll go anywhere God sends me except Kansas. <laughs> and I'm in my 35th year in Kansas. I, I tell this sometimes when I'm speaking to pastors and seminaries and some smart aleck young Seminary student will come up to me and say, I'll go anywhere God sends me except Maui. And I'll tell him it doesn't work that way. You have to really mean it <laughs> before God will listen to you. But as I, as I travel and I train pastors and talk to leaders, they often these days want to ask me about being in one place for going on 35 years. And I just was training a group of pastors in Connecticut last year, and one of the young men raised his hand and asked me, Pastor, weren't you ever tempted to go somewhere else? And I said, yes, especially when things were tough. And frankly, when I went to my church, I didn't know that I would spend the rest of my ministry there. I came from Texas. always figured, you know how it is, Texans are all insufferable. We all are. And I always thought I would go back to Texas. But there would all, and I, I told this young man, every time I was tempted to leave, I would always say, well, I can't go now because there's this thing that I've got to take care of and there's that thing that I've got to take care of and I can't go now. Maybe someday I'll go somewhere else and other churches would try to reach out to me, but I can't go right now because we're in the process of relocation. And the thing about it is there came a day when I realized the sword had taken hold of me. I didn't want to go anywhere else. I was where God placed me. I was where God wanted me to be. And at that moment, it was as if God began to use me in a whole new way. It is strange, isn't it? That the greatness of your life will not be defined by the achievements that you achieve, but rather it will be in the struggles. But there's something deeper here, and I don't want to go too far into the metaphor of our text, but I don't think we can avoid it. The Bible says that Eleazar picked up the sword. In Scripture, we understand, especially in regard to the spiritual armor of Ephesians chapter 6, what the sword is. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 6, 17, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to fight spiritual warfare, if you're going to endure in life struggle, if you want to win, you have to take up the word of God and learn God's word. Now, let's just work with that metaphor for a moment. Remember, Eleazar picked up the sword, and then there was a moment where the sword took hold of Eleazar. What does that mean in regard to the word of God in real terms? Well, when we pick up the sword, when we take up the sword, that's tantamount to learning God's word. That's hearing God's word. When you sit here and you listen to a sermon, you are taking hold of the Word of God. 
But I'll tell you something begins to happen when you begin to obey the word of God. When you begin to say God's word is right and God's word is the deciding factor in this situation, you will notice that there will come a moment where the word of God will take hold of you and you and the word of God will become one. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what we need tonight in this world. We have a generation of so-called Christians who can pick up the word of God and set it down. But when we obey the word of God and we say it's not just God's word that he's spoken out into the empty existence. It is God's word that he has spoken to my heart and I believe it and I process it and I obey it. At that moment, it is, it is, it is like everything changes in your life. We'll be like Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet was called to preach at a very difficult time. For those of you who study the book of Jeremiah, you know that. He got so discouraged at one point in Jeremiah 29, he said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah is like, I'm going to put the sword down. But look at what he says. His word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. That is one of the strangest statements in the Bible. Jeremiah said, I got tired of quitting. Now think about that. He said, I was weary with forbearing. That means I'm tired of quitting. Is there anybody here tonight you're tired of quitting? It's because the word of God has got a hold of you, and you can't put it down because your fabric and the word of God's fabric has become one. If you're in an Eleazar battle tonight, it's a battle of endurance. Every day you're facing the enemy and you're holding on to the promises of God. And somebody could say, Mark, I just don't know if I can hold out much longer. I want you to look at that verse again. If you still have 2 Samuel 23 open, look at verse 10. It said, Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword the Lord brought about a great victory that day. The scriptures tell us in the New Testament that sometimes we do everything just to stand. Eleazar stood his ground. It was a battle of endurance. It wasn't like a 30-minute television show where there's a resolution in the last five minutes. It wasn't like a movie where there's a resolution in the last 10 or 20 minutes. Life sometimes doesn't work that way. Sometimes our battles last a year or five years or 20 years, and the challenge is to endure and to stand our ground. But Eleazar took hold of the sword, and the sword took hold of him and the Bible says, look at this, the Lord brought about a great victory today. You notice nothing here says that Eleazar was particularly strong, just that the Lord brought about a great victory. How many of us need that tonight? How many of us need the Lord to bring about a great victory in a marriage or in a kid's life or a grown kid's life or in your career or in your emotional health? Somebody here tonight could say, Mark, I, I'm, I don't feel special here at First Baptist Indian Trail. I love my church. I love Pastor Mike. I love the people, but I'm nothing special. I'm just here. I volunteer. I serve in the nursery. I'm on the back row of the choir. But I have so many problems. I have problems at work. I have problems at home. I have problems with my health. And you might say, well, I don't feel special. But you're here. The choir sang my favorite song. Several years ago when I was here, I fell in love with the song Safe Thus Far. How many of you could say that tonight? You can say, I don't know how special I feel tonight, but I'm here. I'm still here. By the grace of God, I'm still here. I'm struggling with this, and I'm struggling with that, and I've got this problem, and this is breaking my heart. This is causing me grief. But by the grace of God, I'm still here. Then you're an Eleazar. Eleazar stood his ground. He picked up the word of God. The word of God took hold of him, and by the grace of God, he stayed. He endured, and the Bible tells us God, God got the victory. Now I want you to look at the second battle. This is in verse 11. The Bible says, one time the Philistines gathered at Lehi and attacked the Israelites in a field full of lentils. And the Bible says the Israelite army fled. Now, this is a strange story because the Israelites, David's army, were in a bean field. And suddenly, the Philistines attacked. And the text tells us that the Israelite army ran. Now, that's unusual because ordinarily in David's reign... The soldiers fought, very rare for the soldiers to run away. Now, 
we look at this story and we see the answer as to why they did. It was not that they were cowards. The problem was it was a bean field. And what does a bean field matter? I mean, after all, there's no glory in taking a bean field. When David's soldiers came back to the palace to report to him, they didn't say to him, sir, we captured a bean field. That's not something that will make the newspapers. You might capture a tower. You might capture a hill, a fortress. But a bean field to them was not worth fighting for. But now look at verse 12. But Shammah held his ground in the middle of the field and beat back the Philistines. And here we are again. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Now I want you to think about the difference of attitude between Shammah and the other soldiers in David's army. They ran because they said, it's just a bean field. But Shammah stood and fought because the enemy was in the bean field. I want to talk to us about that for just a little bit tonight. You see, here's the thing. Shammah wasn't in denial about the fact that it was a bean field. He was just concerned because Shammah knew if you let Satan have the bean fields today, he will come back for the subdivision tomorrow. I am watching as Christians today are easing up on things that the Bible warns us about. There are things that Christians are doing today that used, used to Christians would shrink in horror about. And I think of several areas tonight. I think about the area of entertainment. I mean, the entertainment today, in many cases, and I'm not saying it's all this way, but there's a lot of entertainment today that is just practically a sewer. It is filthy in every sense. It is the kind of stuff that would have repulsed Christians in the past. And yet today, many Christians are enjoying that kind of filth. And I see it in language. You know, we're getting very accustomed in our language today to the worst possible kinds of language. I, you know, it is amazing to me, when I was a kid growing up in Texas, if, if a man used profane, filthy words around a lady, it could start a fight. Because you just didn't talk that way around ladies and kids. And yet today I hear ladies and kids talking that way. But it's not just outside the church, it's inside the church. And I'm well aware of why it is. I mean, it's in the entertainment that we just talked about. And our ears are getting accustomed to it and getting attuned to it. And, and Christians are using the same filthy language that the world is using. I mean, there used to be a time when Christians would have the courage to stand up for truth, but Christians can be in a crowd and can hear people say all kinds of wrong things about God and Jesus Christ, and Christians will say, well, I didn't say anything because I didn't want to upset their sensibilities. Now, here is what I want to say to you. I know in many of these cases we're talking about bean fields. And someone can hear this message tonight and say, Mark, that sounds legalistic. And you have to understand, you've never seen anybody who hates legalism as much as I do. I grew up in an area of, well, <laughs> I grew up in a, in a Baptist group that was extremely legalistic. And I got to tell you, I have heard so many me silly messages that were legalistic. I've heard stuff preached against that there was nothing wrong with. I mean, I've heard pre preachers preach on different articles of clothing. I mean, I'm so old. I, I remember back in the 60s in the time when the counterculture was big and rising that there were actually preachers who preached against wearing anything that looked like the Beatles wore. <laughs> now, that's a bean field. It's a bean field. It was a bean field then. It's a bean field now. It will always be a bean field. And, and that is the problem with legalism. See, legalism takes a bean field and tries to make it important. But what we need to understand is a place worth fighting is when the enemy is in the bean field. The question for us tonight is not, is it a bean field or is it just a bean field? The question is, is the enemy there? I mean, here's the thing. Can you watch something that's not healthy, something that's not pure? Can you watch something that's profane and keep your salvation? Yes, you can. But at the same time, the enemy is in the bean field, and I think the enemy has gotten into many Christian homes through many of these avenues. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, the apostle Paul writes, 
and I think, and I'll get to this in just a moment, some parts of this verse are misunderstood. He writes, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now, every once in a while, a Christian will say, well, the Bible says everything is permissible, but you have to understand the punctuation there. There are, there are uh, quotation marks around that. See, punctuation can be important. There was a story about a woman who was on a, a cruise to Europe, and there were, you know, there were diamond merchants on that cruise, and, and she found a beautiful necklace. It was a $100,000 necklace, you know, expensive. She cabled back her husband and said, there's a necklace here. It's $100,000. I want it really bad. Can I have it? He said, no, period, price too high. Well, when they sent her the cable, the period wasn't in there, and all she saw was no price too high. So <laughs> I think sometimes this happens in this verse. So when Paul said, everything is permissible for me, that was a quotation that was popular in Corinth. And in that whacked out church in Corinth, there were a lot of people who would say, well, everything is permissible for me. So Paul came along and he used that quotation. But he's not saying everything's permissible. He just said not everything is beneficial. And he said, I will not be mastered by anything. Church tonight, can we hear the word of God? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 says, Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to him. And may God help us tonight to fight that warfare. And here's the thing. In these days, in 2019 America, even in 2019 Christianity, if you take this approach to life, you're going to have people think you're a prude. You're going to have family members who think that, wow, you're just too over the edge by saying, we don't watch that kind of thing. We don't use that kind of language. We don't go to these kinds of places. We don't, we don't agree with that kind of thinking. Yes, indeed, you're going to have some people who are going to think you're old-fashioned, but by the grace of God, you'll be fighting a key battle. By the way, there weren't a lot of other people fighting with Shammah, were there? He was fighting by himself. Okay, one more, and then we'll be through. Look at verse 20. Here is another warrior named Benaiah. The Bible says, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into the pit and killed it. Now, I love this, and preachers have been preaching on this for years. I can remember hearing sermons on this when I was a little boy. But it is strange when you think about the spiritual battle that Benaiah had to deal with. He met his worst enemy, a lion, in the worst conditions, a snowy day, and in the most impossible battlefield in a pit. I wonder tonight how many of you there are here this evening who have experience in spiritual warfare. And I know there are many. If you have experience in spiritual warfare, you know something. You know that Satan is cruel. And one of his favorite devices is to attack you on multiple fronts. There may be some of you who are dealing with that right now. You say, I could handle it if it was just this one thing. I could handle it if it was just this thing at work, if I weren't dealing with my marriage. Or I could handle it if I were dealing with this situation with my kids, if I wasn't also having to deal with my health. Pastor Mike and I have a great pastor friend. He went through a really difficult thing after being a wonderful pastor for many years. He wanted to do great things for God, and the church he was at at the time wasn't completely in harmony, and so he started all over again after all this time. Went to another part of the country, took a church, a fledgling church, and by the grace of God, that church exploded in growth. They were averaging, I believe, around 1,500. They were in two Sunday services, a Saturday service. They took a, they took a part of a mall. I've seen churches, you know, prepare space in a, an existing building to have church, but I don't think I've ever seen a church do as well as this church. They, they, it, 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 was, it looked like a wonderful building. They had a wonderful church. It was thriving and growing. But then in the midst of it all, our friend got cancer. And he went through treatment. And then when they said he was cancer-free, Mike and I saw him last year in October. And it, it looked like he was doing fine. He went back home, and they found cancer again. 
And he's been fighting that battle, and he's doing great, and I'm thankful for it. But not long after he got back home with his second bout of cancer, he found out that they were going to end his lease at the mall, and they were going to have to walk away. So in the midst of fighting for his life with cancer, they're having to find some place else to worship for this great church of 1,500 people. Now, that's the kind of warfare I'm talking about. It would be one thing if you just dealt with this, but you don't have to deal with this by itself because Satan comes along and he throws this at you and he throws that at you. And, and all of these issues are happening at the same time. That's what happened with Benaiah. He had a snowy day. That's one set of issues. Then he has a lion. That's something else. And then the thing runs into a pit. He's got three battles. strikes me that all three of these things could easily have become excuses for Benaiah. He could have shut things down. I mean, after all, he had bad weather. He had snow. It doesn't snow a lot in that part of the world. I'm from Texas. It doesn't snow much there. It shuts everything down to get a half inch of snow. And Benaiah could have gone outside that day and said, wow, this is not a good day for fighting warfare because it's snowing. And then he had the worst problem, a lion. He could have said, you know, if only it was a fox. I could handle a fox on a bad day. I could handle a lion on a good day, but I can't handle a lion on a bad day. And then the thing ran into the pit. Why did the lion run into the pit? I don't think anyone knows for sure. Maybe that's because the lion would have had the advantage. Just like we talked about the sword earlier, let's take a moment and talk about the lion because we know who that is. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. One of my favorite verses in the Bible that I remind myself often of is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, where the Bible says, lest Satan should get the advantage, we are not unaware of his schemes. One translation says, devices, another says, but really the Greek word there is nous, which means thinking. The Bible tells us we know how Satan thinks. God's thinking is above our thinking, Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. We know that. But the Bible tells us we can understand how Satan thinks. And Scripture tells us we better know how he thinks because if we don't know how he thinks, he could get the advantage of us. Could I say to every one of us here tonight, Satan knows where our pit is. He knows your pit. He knows my pit. And he knows how to come against us. With me, it's anxiety. For others of you here, it could be jealousy. For others of you here, it could be discouragement. I mean, you name it. He knows the pit to put us in. And here we have a guy who has the worst set of circumstances. It's a snowy day. He's got the worst enemy. And now it's in the pit. And there's nothing he can do but fight. This is a simple sentence, but i got to tell you there is one word that stands out to me, and that's in verse 20, where it says, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. See, the challenge for us, when Satan comes against us on multiple fronts, it's, it's the temptation to just shut down and say, I can't fight this battle. Now, I said at the beginning of this message what I'm going to say now at the close. I don't want this just to be metaphor. I want this to be real in your life. What would it mean then? What would it mean to chase the lion in the worst circumstances with the worst enemy and in the toughest spot? I really believe chasing here simply means you stay on the course of your life. Mary Alice and I were given a special invitation this year. I'd been privileged to become friends with the Consul General for the State of Israel for the Southwestern United States. We have the ambassador here, and then the consulate's divided with Consul's General. I think there are like five or six of them now. There used to be three. Our Consul General used to be in Chicago, but now he's based in Houston. And he's become a good friend. He was in the Netanyahu government, and he's been posted now to this assignment. And he called me, I think actually late last year, and he said, you want to go to Israel with me? And he said, um, if you'll fly over here, he said, uh, the state of Israel will pay for your trip here. That sounded good to me. And so 
we went to Israel and we had a wonderful time. We met with the foreign minister and met with some ambassadors and they showed us different parts of the country, some of the things you would have imagined we would have looked at. But then they took Mary Alice and me down with the other members of our group and the consul general. They took us down to the Gaza border, to a border crossing. In fact, that border crossing is in the news this week because quite a few rockets have been launched at that border crossing. It's in today's news. And as we walked around, we walked around with a guy who is the police chief. He is IDF guy, but I mean, he's just basically judge and jury in that part of the world because there are like 800 trucks that cross over from Israel into Gaza and from Gaza all over into Israel. They have to check everyone. They're men with automatic weaponry everywhere, three and four foot reinforced concrete all over the place. And here is this guy who himself, this leader, had been wounded three times. And he was hosting us. I'm sure he was busy. He had just gotten through hosting former Governor Nikki Haley right before we got there. And as he showed us around, he told us, he showed us the bunker and he said, you know, he said, if the sirens go off and you're in Tel Aviv, you can finish your coffee. He said, if the sirens go off here, we've got 15 seconds to get in there. And as we walked around and looked at that concrete yard with trucks lined up going back and forth from both places. He showed us places in the concrete that had been gashed by mortar. And while he showed us that, he said something to me that I don't think I'll ever forget. He said, we live in abnormal here, and somehow we have to find normal every day. I left there and I went to the town of Surat. And the mayor showed us around the town. And one of the first places she showed us was a chain link fenced yard of spent rockets that were sent over into Sarad. It's a border town. And she showed us how that every home had a bomb shelter. And while we looked at the terrain around the city of Sarat, the fields were still smoking from balloon bombs that had fallen that day. But one of the things that stood out to me as we went through the town of Surat is the statuary in all the parks. And they have the most beautiful parks in that town for their children. The statuary in the parks are statues of musical instruments. A lot of, a lot of musicians have come from that town. And those statues are made out of the spent rockets that the enemy had lobbed over to kill them. Now, when I speak tonight about what it means to chase the enemy, when you've got the worst enemy aligned and the worst conditions, a snowy day, and you're in the worst situation, I really do listen to the words of that police chief that day. It is finding normal in abnormal. The enemy brings the abnormal, but the grace of God and the power of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit allows us to get on with life. Even though we're challenged and frightened by all the things that Satan brings into our life, by the grace of God, I get up in the morning and I shower and I put on my clothes and I go to work and I love my wife and I keep my word and I do what I'm supposed to do. Even though I'm under attack, that is what it means to chase the lion into a pit on a snowy day. Why does Satan do that to us? He wants you to believe that he can make, listen to me please, Satan wants you to believe that he can make all things work against you. But what do we know from the word of God? Romans 8.28 tells us, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call to the, to according to his purpose. I love the way the New International Version puts it. It puts it in three phrases. We know in all things God works for good. It doesn't say all things are good. It just says in all things God works for good. Look at your life tonight. You may be chasing a lion on a snowy pit and the thing may run uh, on a snowy day and it may run into a pit. But know this, even if everything you can see in your life is bad, you know that if you love God in all things, God works. You say, Mark, I don't see how God can make good out of this, but he's God. 
In all things, God works for good. For good. I preached yesterday at New Spring and Saturday on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says we walk by faith and not by sight. You know, when we walk by faith, we can see more than the world can see. It's not that we deny reality. The Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with sight. It just says we don't live that way. We live by seeing more. Well, I think if you could have caught Benaiah when he was chasing that lion, he would have said something like this. Wow, it's snowing today. Oh, no, there's a lion. Uh Uh-oh, the crazy thing is running into a pit. If we could have talked to him later, I think he would have said, boy, that was a perfect day for lion hunting. It's a good thing it was snowing. If that thing hadn't run into a pit, I'd have never caught him. Isn't that how we are? I've always said, I'm really good at seeing God out out my rearview mirror. I just can't see him out my windshield very well. Who am I talking to tonight? you got so many things in your life that are working against you. Like I said, if it was a fox on a snowy day, you could handle it. If it's a lion on a good day, you could handle it, but it's a lion on a snowy day. Oh, child of God, God can take all of those things and he can make them make sense. Would you give me this personal latitude to tell you a story out of my life? It's not a story I enjoy telling. God has been so good to me. Like I said, I've been at my church. It'll be 35 years next June. And we've seen God grow it from 350 a week when I first came there to like, we had over 7,000 last week. God's allowed us to relocate. I mean, I could just keep you here telling you all kinds of wonderful things. God saves many souls every week at our church. We have now a thriving television ministry. In all that time, as many things as God was doing in my life and through what he allowed me to do, I had a secret that I really couldn't tell anybody about. Mary Alice knew a little. And that was there were times in my life where I could deal with crippling anxiety, unexplicable anxiety, panic attacks. And that's kind of a challenge to talk about when you're a pastor. When you lead a great ministry and great things are happening, and I'd fought so many battles, and, and I've always had the, <laughs> I, I, I've always had this in my personality. I mean, it's like when I was a kid playing sports, there were two facts. I always got hurt, and I would always say, leave me alone, I'm fine. I mean, it didn't matter. I mean, I, I, playing football, I broke an elbow, I broke a leg, and tore an ACL out of my left knee. But all three times, I got up and played after each one of those injuries. I mean, if whatever I play sports-wise, I get hurt. If I took, took up chess, I get carpal tunnel. That's just how it is. <laughs> so I, I dealt with so many things through the years, so many challenges, and I just rolled with it. I'd always been the adult in the room. I'd always been large and in charge, and, and everybody around me had gotten accustomed to that. I could take you to the spot if you were in Wichita, I could take you to the place on 13th Street, just south of our church. I had left the campus after preaching the second Saturday night service, and I was on my way home, and I still don't know exactly what happened. I just know I fell off the wire. I just snapped. And from that moment on, for weeks, I didn't want to talk to anybody, didn't really want to see anybody. I just became, Mary Alice has known me since high school days, and I just... I just kind of like imploded on myself. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that, never been through anything like that. And week by week, I got worse and worse. And it was strange. I was able to preach somehow, but I was like a battery-operated device, just getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And finally, as the end of 2010 came, it became clear that Mary Alice just needed to get me away. And my church and my board were so good. And we wound up going to Phoenix, Arizona and trying to make sense of things, trying to figure it out, trying to get some sense of sanity, but I was getting worse every day. 
There might be an hour or so that I'd feel like talking, but then I would just sort of shrink back into my shell. And thankfully, by the grace of God, just to let you know, I came out of that, and within a matter of weeks, the Lord allowed me to get back and kind of restructure some things in my life. And these last, these last nine years have been really important. But I want to take you to a particularly dark day, maybe the darkest day of my life. I remember it well. It was New Year's Eve in 2010. And by this point, I almost, I, I felt like I prayed. I prayed, I read scripture all the time, but it was like I couldn't get through. And I got weaker and weaker by the moment. And I remember as I sat on the couch in the condo in Phoenix, Arizona. I sat there and I thought, what do I know for sure? And the only thing I could think of that I knew for sure was that Jesus saves. And I picked up the computer and I just started typing. I wasn't typing to write a sermon. I wasn't typing to write anything in particular. I was just, I thought, I know Jesus saves. I, I don't know where I am. I told Mary Alice on the airplane, I don't think I can ever go back. I didn't know what the future held. held. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know why I was in that state. I just knew Jesus saved. And I just started typing everything I could type about. And I typed for, for hours. And as I said, from that point on, the Lord did a series of wonderful things and helped me get a better understanding of the ADD that I'd left untreated for most of my life and the anxiety issues that I faced. And by the grace of God, I got well and got back home and got back to work and kind of forgot about a lot of that. I remembered that our staff had been after me to write a book about salvation. And I'd never, and I'm so busy, I'd, I'd never really written a book like they wanted me to write because they said we need something to give to people who've just accepted Christ. And I don't even know for sure how it happened, but a month or so later I got thinking about all that stuff that I had written about salvation. I hadn't looked at it because I didn't really want to look back on anything from that time period. But I opened up the file and I began to look at what I'd written and I suddenly realized this was a primer on salvation. We took it to the publisher, we had it bound, we turned it into copies, it's called My New Life with Christ, we've had 70,000 of them sent to prisons, we've, I mean, we're in 37 prisons in the United States, on, on beyond that, we've had probably over 100,000 people, that's the first book they've read after they trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I will tell you, on the worst day of my life, God took where I was, he took my lion, he took my pit, he took my snowy day, and he worked together, and he made it work for good. And today, as I said, so many people have read that. That's the first book they've read after they've trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. That is, I heard Pastor Mike preach a great message on the benefits of being saved. That is one of the benefits of being saved. That in all things, God works for good. I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me, please, now, because it's time for us to look at our lives and look at God working. And I don't know what kind of battle that you're fighting tonight. It may Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.